Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor, and joining me on screen is Rachel Dance, who is going to be doing our sign language interpretation for the course of today's webinar. If BSL is something that you benefit from, then you will be able to move Rachel around on the screen. You can put the webcams whereabouts you find most useful. So do please just re rearrange things to make it as useful for you as it can possibly be. Uh, we're delighted to have Rachel with us uh, to provide what we think is a very important service. Now, today's webinar is about managing isolation, and it's part of our Building a Better Chemistry Culture series, which is something that Chemistry World has developed alongside the Royal Society of Chemistry's Inclusion and Diversity team. So throughout this series, we're going to illuminate the science behind the different issues being experienced during and because of the coronavirus crisis. We'll be providing support tailored to the needs of chemical scientists, which will include sharing coping strategies, reducing stigma around mental health and discussion of well-being and so on. Today's focus is on isolation and loneliness, so we're going to look beyond the COVID-19 lockdowns to explore the context for why somebody in the chemical sciences may feel isolated and how building meaningful connections can help to create a sense of belonging. I'll let you know a bit more about our speakers in just a sec, but first of all, uh, welcome to the GoToWebinar software. Now, the software here is designed to allow you to interact with us, so it's not just about you absorbing what we have to say, but it's also about us listening to you. And the best way to do that is to use the questions box, which is almost certainly at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel, which by default will be on probably the right-hand side of your screen. If you have any questions at any time as we're going through the webinar, then just pop them into that questions box at the bottom, and we will uh, either answer you straight away in text, if it's something that we can help with, or we will put it to our speakers at the end of the webinar. So do please get all of your questions in there. This is as much about you as it is about our guests. And our three guests that we have today, Amita Desog, uh, Assistant Professor in the Chemistry Department at the Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. I'm terribly sorry, I have a really itchy nose. Uh, Aaron Burko, who is a uh, lecturer in Forensic Science and Chemistry at the University of Kent. And Desiree Dickinson, who's a clinical psychologist who specializes in the mental health and well-being of our research community. So they are going to be taking us through various issues around uh, the impact of isolation and loneliness, how we manage it, how different aspects of our daily lives, our work lives and our research and study lives uh, can help us to deal with the problems that stem from isolation. So any questions you have for them at any point, do get it in. And uh, we'll have a few presentations. We'll also have a poll in there so we get to know a little bit more about you and how you manage uh, isolation if you've ever felt isolated. If you're one of the very lucky people who has never felt lonely, then thank you ever so much for joining us. Maybe you can share some tips by firing them in as if they were a question into the questions box and we'll be able to share that with the rest of the audience. This is being recorded, so if you miss any part of this, if you have to leave early, if there's anything you'd just like to go back and watch again, we'll send you an email soon with a link to the recording. You'll be able to watch that in your own time. And as a little thank you, everybody who has attended in real time today will also be sent a PDF certificate just to, to say thank you for attending. That's quite enough from me. What I should do now is hand over to Mita Dasog, who, as I said, Assistant Professor in the Chemistry Department in uh, Halifax, Cal in Canada, I was actually California there, which is confusing because the only Halifax I know of is the one where my mum actually grew up, uh, up in Yorkshire in the north of England. Uh, but no, Halifax, uh, Canada. Uh, so it's good to see we have a nice international team with us as well today. Mita, thank you ever so much for joining us. I will hand over control to you now and let you take it away with your presentation. Thank you, Ben. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the Chemistry World and the uh, Diversity and the Inclusion Team at the Royal Society of Chemistry for giving me this opportunity today to share some of my personal experiences on being isolated in academia and how I've tried to overcome some of these things. A lot of the recent studies and surveys have shown that increasing number of academics feel uh, isolated at workplace and academia. For example, this study done in UK has shown that 
over 60% of PhD students feel alone. And a lot of similar studies done across the globe has shown that this is becoming a predominant issue in academia and anywhere from undergraduate students all the way to full professors feel isolated, feel alone. And despite this being such a big problem, uh, this is not something we talk about a lot or actively working towards addressing these issues. So what are some of the reasons that one might feel isolated? Um, there's some I've listed on this particular slide. Uh, oftentimes, there are multiple reasons why we would feel isolated, and they're interconnected with each other, which really creates this very complex network to navigate through. Now, today, I'm not really going to be talking about all of these uh, issues, but I'll be focusing more on some of my personal story, some of the personal barriers I faced in academia, uh, and what I've done. So to tell you a little bit more about myself, so I'm a type 1 diabetic. Uh, so type 1 diabetes is a chronic illness, which if not managed properly, can have some very serious health consequences. So because I'm a diabetic, often my lifestyle is quite rigid uh, and it's recommended that I live a very disciplined life where I try to do the same thing at the same time every day. I also need to have a very healthy lifestyle. So, you know, eat healthy and exercise, uh, make sure I don't drink a lot uh, and also generally be happy. And that matters because uh, when you're stressed or when you're anxious, uh, the sugar levels can be all over the place, uh, which makes me feel sick. And that causes more stress. And then now I'm stuck in sort of a very vicious cycle of feeling physically and emotionally unwell. So those are my restrictions. Now, on the other side, we have academia, which we know can be quite unpredictable. The high workload, the deadlines kind of make it very difficult to have this rigid lifestyle to be very self-disciplined. A lot of the social events in academia revolves around alcohol and pub food and comfort food, uh, which isn't quite healthy for me. And the competitive nature of academia can also make it very stressful and kind of really interfere with that happiness factor. So when I was a graduate student, so when I first started my PhD, you know, I really wanted to be accepted by my peers. I didn't want my diabetes to be a thing dictating my lifestyle. Um, so I indulged in a lot of these activities that was not healthy for me. So I started to get sick and more sick uh, as time went on. And so I stopped socializing because it really inhibited me from going out and having a good time. It also started affecting my work. Um, I couldn't do research as well. I started to fall behind. And all of this sort of really started me to feel very down. And because I was missing the social activities, the other thing that happened is people then started, uh, stopped inviting me to events. And that really contributed to this feeling of being isolated. I felt like I didn't belong, I wasn't wanted here. And a year into my PhD, um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. So with my diabetes, my depression, uh, trying to do a PhD, it was just all too much. And I just had a very hard time managing all of this. And I felt very alone. I felt like I wasn't good enough to be doing a PhD. And that's when I considered quitting the graduate program. But the graduate secretary at the university was kind enough to tell me that, you know, maybe before you'd make that big decision to just quit, uh, take some time off, uh, take a medical leave, think about it. And if you do decide to quit, you can still do that. So that's what I decided to do. Um, I took some time off, a couple months off um, to think over it. I did come back to the PhD program, but it wasn't really easy to come back. Um, I was very embarrassed for having taken the time off that I needed to take that time off, that obviously, you know, I was not strong enough to do PhD or research. I wasn't good enough to handle it. I did lose a lot of friends because of that, uh, because people 
felt very uncomfortable around me. They didn't really know what to do, how to feel. Uh, so they just sort of abandoned me. So I just, when I came back, I kept to myself. Um, I didn't really talk to anybody. I barely even made eye contact with people. The turning point for me really was one of my lab mates kind of reached out to me and shared their experience on depression and also how they felt alone and isolated in academia. And then a couple other people joined the conversation as well. And it was the first time I felt like maybe I was not crazy, uh, that I was not alone. And sharing those experiences and seeing that other people have similar struggles gave me that sense of belonging. So that really helped. And that's one of the reasons why um, I choose to sort of share my experience today uh, and at other platforms is because I want people to know out there that, you know, if you do have these struggles, you're not alone and you do belong in academia as much as any of us do. So uh, removing this mental health stigma helps go a long way to being accepted in the community. And a lot of my personal experiences has really shaped how I mentor my students, how I run my group right now as a PI. Uh, and because I've gone through uh, these struggles, I have a very open conversation with my students when they start graduate school about the pressures and what that can do to their health. Uh, I really stress the importance of being proactive about self-care. I don't think anyone should feel guilty about taking care of themselves. It should be the top priority and also seek professional help. You know, that's not something we should shame people for. Now, I do know professional help is not something that is accessible to everybody, but hopefully moving forward institutions realize that and make that a priority. But really, you know, don't wait till things get bad. Uh, seek help as soon as you can, uh, and if possible, seek professional help. Something I realized during my postdoc was the importance of having a supportive network. Now, I was a big name institution, so I had imposter syndrome, I was in a long distance marriage, uh, I was applying for jobs, uh, and all of this was too much. And, you know, there was a lot going on, but the research group I was in was very supportive. They never made me feel stupid. You know, they helped me learn the concepts of this very interdisciplinary research I was involved in. They helped proofread my proposals when I was applying for jobs. Um, they tried to arrange the social activities to accommodate uh, my diabetes and my sort of rigid uh, schedule into it. So that made me feel very welcome and it did wonders for my mental health. And, you know, and since then we have supported each other through our careers and they have helped me get through COVID isolation. So when you do come across some people like that, you know, make sure you hold on to them. But it also made me realize that group dynamics is very important. And as a PI, I'm very particular about who I take into my group. Um, I share the group guidelines with the prospective students so they know the expectations around the collaborative nature of our work. And they can really see for themselves that if their personal values aligns with the group expectations um, before they join the group. And that's something I would advise for people is that, you know, when you're looking for research groups, don't just look for science. Also see how you would fit in. Are they going to be supportive? Are they going to be welcoming? Now, we all know that academia is very competitive. And that definitely did play a very big role in my well-being as well. You know, being a person of color, being a female, and given all my initial experiences with PhD, I always had this pressure to prove myself and to perform. And that really took a toll on my well-being. And with the help of my therapist and my partner, something I worked on is my attitude towards what I define as success. And thanks to them, rather than trying to be better than somebody else, I've tried to internalize that. And I now try to be a better version of myself. And that's been very helpful. And it's made me a better person. I am happier. 
but also more importantly, it helped me be happy for other people and their success as well. And again, this is something I've incorporated in my group is where student assessments are done sort of more on an individual basis. And this really makes sense because, you know, the playing field is really not even. Everyone starts at a very different point. They have very different backgrounds. They have very different career goals. So evaluating them against each other is not really fair. So we set goals on an individual basis and see how they're making that progress. And again, this has really helped my research group to also not be competitive with each other, but be supportive of each other. Now, this really takes a lot of conscious effort and practice, you know, so don't be frustrated with yourself if you don't find yourself thinking like this tomorrow, right? This is something that will come with time. And the last thing today I wanted to touch on was on socializing. Now, if we all are social beings, we do crave, you know, that company of other people. And to be honest, this is something I still struggle with. Uh, I'm still diabetic, so I still have a lot of that rigid lifestyle and that restriction. Uh, and being an academic, oftentimes you're also moving from one place to another, which really disrupts that social circle. And it's really hard to make friends, especially as you get older, you know, you have other responsibilities. Um, so it can be quite tough to participate in some of these spontaneous social activities that happen. So I want to share some of the things that have worked for me. I do acknowledge that this might not work for everybody, but uh, I do hope you can take something with that, uh, with this information. Uh, something that has worked for me is scheduling more of a one on one or small group gathering around coffee or lunch. Uh, this is not as disruptive to my schedule. You know, this is something I can do during my work day. I can bring my own lunch so I don't have to worry about the food as much. Um, with one of my colleagues, we also just walk around the campus so that way I get my physical activity done and I can also socialize that way. Uh, so having these kind of small things does help. Uh, I also regularly chat with my uh, former friends from postdoc and PhD days. Uh, I know this is not the same as in-person interaction, but it still goes a long way, especially when I first moved to Halifax and I didn't know anybody here and I was starting this uh, assistant professor job. Uh, it definitely helped me to give, you know, to feel like I was not alone. Now, with my research group, of course, my students sort of have their own uh, peer to support and socialize with. But when it comes to group social activities, I try to make it as inclusive as possible. Uh, one thing we have really looked for is to try to move away from the alcohol centered activities um, and also plan more free activities so there's no financial constraints and make it more family friendly so people can bring their partners and uh, kids if possible. So this is my awesome group here, uh, but I must say the credit really goes to them. They have really taken the initiative to make it a very welcoming atmosphere for each other. And something that we did discuss before the COVID shutdown happened is that where every group member gets to suggest an activity that is inclusive and we all get to try. Uh, so that's something I do look forward to trying in the future once the restrictions are lifted. So really in closing, I wanted to say that um, I hope we continue to have these conversations around mental health. Uh, we have come a long way in the last 10 years. Uh, in, um, in the last couple of years, it's nice to see that we are more open about it. So I think we need to continue to do that to remove the stigma around mental health. But also more importantly is address the issues that is affecting people's mental health in academia. Why is this happening and how can we make that better? Uh, we evaluate our success metrics, you know, rather than having this publish or perish kind of mentality, you know, try to be more inclusive, be more family friendly um, and have more flexible work hours and be more accommodating of other commitments people might have. And if you are planning an inclusive social gathering, you know, try to be as inclusive as possible. Think outside the box. Don't go for the sort of regular uh, call uh, based activities. Try to think how you can get more people to come. Uh, that's all I have to say today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. This is my email address here. Uh, and with that, thank you everyone for your attention.
Peter, thank you ever so much. A uh, really interesting presentation. Thank you for being so open and honest with us. I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, your story is not all that unusual. There are a great deal of people, especially in a high stress situation, like doing a, a PhD or a postdoc, who do experience problems with their mental health. And we don't talk about it a great deal. So it is really valuable to have somebody like yourself who's happy to take us through that story. I'm just sorry that it happened to you and sorry that, that you've had to live through it, but thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we will come back to you for questions at the end, but just a very quick one. When you got members of your lab to suggest the different activities, uh, what was the thing that you found most surprising or perhaps the one that you didn't expect to enjoy, but you enjoyed the most? A lot of the art sort of based uh, gatherings, uh, you know, having things like paint night or, you know, trying to make something more art and crafty kind of things. So uh, that was uh, a little bit surprising, I guess. I don't know why, but it was nice to see that they're interested in the arts because I like painting. So it's nice to see that in my group members as well. Very nice. Uh, and what's been the, uh, has anybody gone for anything really sort of physically challenging if you had to go to climbing walls and that sort of thing? Not so much wall climbing, but a lot of hiking. There's really beautiful trails in Halifax. Uh, so that's definitely on the list is to go for these hikes and uh, do picnics uh, by the ocean. So. Excellent. And it must be nice to have a diversity of different things to do as well. I guess once you unshackle yourself from needing to be at somewhere that has an alcohol license, then it opens the whole world up. Exactly. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again, Rita. Thank you very much. Now, our next speaker is Aaron Burke, who's a lecturer in forensic science and chemistry at the School of Physical Sciences at the University of Kent. He's passionate about helping students to find and establish communities to improve their sense of belonging in their studies and their future careers. But before we actually hand over to Aaron, we'd like to know a little bit more about you and the ways that you cope or the things that help you to avoid the feelings of isolation. So very soon I will put a poll on the screen and uh, the question is what helps you to avoid those feelings of isolation and they are the sort of social relationships, your family and your friends. It could be support that you get from your manager or from your direct colleagues uh, or possibly or events organized by your own work or university so you might have a work sports and social club or uh, a journal club and maybe even a, a board games club at work um, or is it the events that you find outside of your official uh, your, you know, your extracurricular activities maybe you're in a sports team maybe you are a uh, boy scout leader or a girl guide leader uh, anything like that something that helps you to have a sense of community outside of work so very soon i'll share that poll on screen we'll then go quiet for a short while uh, while you have an opportunity to fill that in and once you have then that's also a great time to get your questions in to the questions box so I'll share the poll in just a sec. You ask some questions, we'll be back with the results and then we'll hand over to Aaron. Thank you to everyone for voting. We're going to close that down now. Thank you very much for voting in that poll. Before we hand over to Aaron, let's just see those results. 
So 86% of people have said it's their friends and family. 36% say support from managers and colleagues. 49 say social community groups, their hobbies, their sports teams. And uh, 33 saying their workplace activities, networking events, social clubs. Let's hide that again. So Aaron, thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, those uh, are different sorts of activities that uh, people do in order to try and avoid feeling isolated. It does seem that that key demographic there is friends and family, uh, but also community social groups are playing a significant role. I believe that's something that we're going to come to in your presentation. So I will stop wittering on, I'll hand over control to you, Aaron, and uh, we'll pick up with your presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to to the RSC and also the Country Award for, for inviting me. And thank you, Nita, for that wonderful presentation as well. Um, very, very informative. Um, as you've heard, my name is Aaron Burkle. I'm a lecturer in chemistry and forensic science at the University of Kent. And just to give you an overview of of my talk uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'll be really looking for coming from the angle of um, diversity and inclusion. So uh, I will look at the causes of isolation, um, forms of isolation, and some of the effects of isolation and how we can also overcome isolation. Uh, I must say that the list that I'm going to give is by no means exhaustive. It's just some of the things I've come across uh, in my role as an academic and also as a higher education cha um, chaplain at the University of Kent for some 15 or so years now. So that is what uh, I'm going to be doing. So if we look at the causes of isolation, I think it's, it's important that we understand that though there is a, a marked increase in, in students from, from gender, class and ethnically diverse backgrounds coming to university in the last 20 years or so, the academic culture, you know, whether real or perceived, tends to reflect the dominant discourse of the student learner, you know, as white, middle class, and, and often male. And this notion is supported by a number of, of researchers, uh, Reed, for example, uh, Misa and Grant, uh, respectively, 2003, 95, 1997, all seem to support this notion. So the university landscape in the UK, in particular, has changed and continues to change, uh, especially in the last 20 years or so. Students and staff now come from very diverse backgrounds. And, and this is good, but can often present some challenges for, for those students and, and staff that may come from the non-traditional backgrounds. And, and if we are to understand and, and help overcome isolation, we need to understand that Academic culture is not uniformly accessed or, or experienced. It depends very much, you know, on the background and context that, that the person is, is coming from. Um, so, like I said, the proportion of non-traditional students is increasing, especially in, in our own university, for example, we, we are finding that to be the case. You know, however, the traditional institutional culture and existing academic discourse can often lead to a sense of isolation among some students and academics as well. Um, research has shown that the students and staff from non-traditional backgrounds are often uh, at a loss when it comes to the institutional culture because they, they can often be, be viewed, albeit unintentionally, as, as the other. And then this can lead to a sense of isolation among them. So to look a bit more closely at the actual causes of isolation that, that I have come across. Uh, the first one is the socioeconomic background of, of the student or even staff. And even with the introduction of, of grants and tuition fee loans, uh, students from economically um, low backgrounds, if you like, are still the minority in, in many universities. Um, it's, it's changing, especially in the post-1992 universities, but it, it tends to be the case still you know, in the older universities. Most of, of these students that um, come from, you know, economically challenged backgrounds um, are also perhaps that the first ones to ever go to university in their families, and this can place them as the other even before they, they start the university education. 
many also have to work to, to make ends meet whilst, whilst they're studying, and which means that they often miss out on non-academic activities like societies and clubs, uh, for example. And they can often find the whole university environment very, very different to their own backgrounds. And, and thus, they can struggle to find a sense of belonging um, whilst they are at, at, at the university. And this can often lead to a sense of, of being isolated. The, the other cause is also age. Um, the, the university is not set up often with the material student in mind. You know, lack of provision around childcare, uh, for example, and um, clubs and societies are often set up not having material students in mind. Uh, and also the, the small number of material students that would be on any um, program, for example, can often cause them to feel very, very isolated. And that needs to be taken into consideration. Gender it is also a, another thing that I find some disciplines are traditionally seen as no disciplines and, and often the women uh, feel out of place in, in these um, subject areas. STEM um, subjects tend to fall in, in this category. But however, you know, it, it must be said that the, the, there is a lot of good work that is being done currently to try and address this, but that can also be a, a source of, of isolation. The, the next thing is also nationality. It, it can be difficult for a young person to go to university for the first time, you know, leaving home and, and family often traveling away from, from their local area to go to university, it can be quite difficult and challenging. But international students have the added burden of adjusting to a new culture. And often their lack of, of proficiency in the English language can, can affect their, their ability to fully participate, engage, and engage with the um, lectures that they, they are a part of. And they can often leave them isolated and also drain of their confidence and they can become academically isolated. The other cause is also ethnicity. You know, um, most students will, will, will pick universities and you know very happily go along, albeit it's, it's a difficult thing going to university for the first time, but minority ethnic students are often explicitly aware of the role of the ethnicity in the construction of belonging and otherness in higher education. And often many of them will pick universities you know, based upon the, the number of people like them at that university. And most ethnic minority students will pick universities near the capital, for example, so that they can you know, be among a very diverse uh, student makeup. Motivation and expectation can also uh, be a cause of isolation. You know, many students, when they come to university, for them, they're there to, to acquire a very good degree as a means of escaping their economic background. And they're often encouraged and, and even you know, expected by their family to focus entirely on their education and not give much time to social activities, which can, in of, of themselves, you know, build that network and support systems that you need to, to help you get through um, the university experience. So, you know, engagement with diversity can no longer be avoided if we are to deal with isolation effectively. And according to um, research, engagement with diversity is essential for the 21st century learning environment because it provides the opportunity for all stakeholders, um, students, um, academics, and support staff to interact across you know, bands of culture, ethnicity, demography, and many other aspects that will typically define concerns when it comes to diversity. Uh, and it's important that we, we engage with diversity to help you know, overcome this sense of isolation amongst many students and also staff. So what I've covered so far really has focused on students, but amongst you know, academics, researchers, support staff, and staff in the professional services, Isolation can also be caused by the aforementioned reasons, but also by, by the following. Number one is, is lack of networks. Networking is, is important and also even crucial, you know, if, if you are to, to settle in, in the workplace or even progress, because often through these networks, information is shared and opportunities are revealed. And if you don't have extensive network in your place of work, that can, can be a challenge. 
and, and cost isolation, especially amongst our staff. The type of contract that one is on, if you want teaching and scholarship contracts, for example, um, opportunities for, for promotion and, and being involved in research groups, for example, becomes a, a difficulty. Um, often, depending on the university you come from, if you're on a TNS scholarship, you know, you're not viewed with the same respect and reverence as someone on a teaching uh, and, 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 and research contract, for example. Also, if you're on a temporary contract, perhaps one that is short term, you're there for six months to a year, um, it, it, it makes it quite difficult for you to form those networks that can support you in terms of not being isolated. Stage of your career, you know, early career researchers and academics can often find themselves isolated. The, the competitive nature of academia, you know, can lead to lack of, of, of support, uh, especially amongst early um, stage academics. So now I want us to look um, briefly at the forms of isolation, what forms do does isolation take? The first one is institutional um, isolation. This is defined as the lack of knowledge about access to and interactions with organizational sources of power and support. Uh, it is the feeling that no matter your educational background and character, you will not be accepted unless you are validated by the dominant culture. And women and ethnic minorities often find themselves in this position. They often lack access to information and networks that can aid them in, the upper, in, the, in their progression. Um, the next form is academic isolation. And like I, I said before, international students often have to adjust to a new educational system. Um, and also medium of instruction. You know, not only would they struggle with the medium of instruction, but also some of the cultural terms that are used by instructors and or their peers. And, and such isolation can cause them to really suffer academically and the performance may, may drop. And you know, the, the, their sense of, of well-being and confidence can also suffer because they are unable to communicate and effectively receive knowledge from their peers and also from their instructors. The next form that I've come across often is social isolation. And this really is the, the feeling of exclusion from supportive networks, the feeling of, of being invisible, receiving little or no interaction, receiving little or no eye contact when you walk in the corridors and you're passed by by your by your colleagues. You know, a, a sense that you are you are singled out and you're only called upon and maybe put on display, you know, as the ethnic minority or the gender representative of your of your organization. And in a sense of you are being tolerated but not really fully accepted. You know, a, a sense that you have to continually demonstrate your ability, you know, whatever your educational background and or experience. And this can lead to a sense of being socially isolated. And, and all of these things can lead to what I call the um, psychological isolation, this imposter syndrome. You, you start feeling like maybe you don't belong, maybe you're not you know, capable or, or able to, um, to be in that setting and can you know, lead to things like uh, mental health issues um, amongst other things. And they, they can be quite um, serious things. So what are the effects? You know, there are many, many effects that I, I could have mentioned. Some have already been mentioned by, by Mita, the, the, the previous presenter. But, you know, low attainment is an effect of isolation, I believe. The attainment gap, you know, between um, black students and white students, for example, stands about 20%. Black students in the UK are 20% less likely to, you know, attain a 2 one or a first class um, in their degrees. It can also lead to low retention among students and also staff. Uh, they drop out rates for uh, people from ethnic minority backgrounds are much higher compared to uh, white students, for example. It can lead to lack of progression and promotion uh, in the workplace. Uh, and it can also lead to just low staff morale and productivity. And, and also, as we heard before, it can lead to some very serious mental health complications as well, if not dealt with. So how can we overcome isolation? Um, 
in my own experience, the way I have overcome the isolation in the workplace and the way I know uh, people, for example, that may fall in the international student category or, or the BAME category, the way they have coped, mainly is through sites and clubs. But often it's quite difficult if you if you're if you having to work to make ends meet whilst you're at university, your ability to join these club societies can be compromised and, and that can itself not be a source of support for you. Um, religious and faith groups also, uh, many that fall in the BAM category, international students tend to find um, support through religious and faith groups. And at Kent, we have a very active you know, religious and faith group community at Kent. And family, so I was not very surprised at all that about 86% of people said they rely on family and friends for, for support. They can often be a, a really good source of, of, of support and, and strength as well, especially if you're feeling isolated either as a student or uh, an academic. These are all very good in my opinion, but what I have found that often it can increase the sense of isolation that you may feel within your institution or workplace because you don't have the opportunity to build an extensive network within your institution or workplace and that sense of isolation can be intensified. Though you're receiving support from, from external sources, this sense of isolation within the workplace or institution can become intensified. So how can we you know, provide some internal support systems? Research groups are, are great. You know, uh, Mita said the way she goes about recruiting people and running her, her research group is, is quite different. And, and, and she takes into account you know, the diverse needs of, of her students. Um, for early, uh, academic, early career academics also, it can be a source of, of building um, networks of support as well. Those that are genus contracts can be invited to sit on these research groups. Um, some of them may not be directly involved in research, but they supervise final year students, for example. Some also supervise uh, research master students as well, and they can be invited to sit on these groups as either associate members or full members, if, if need be. Um, you can also set up a special group, which we've done at Kent, um, and they can obviously carry out education research and also inform um, teaching on a, on a school wide level. And, and also, they can network with people in the same contracts in other universities and institutions as well. Um, actively mentor and support early career staff and, and those from minority groups. You know, if, if you find that there are, there are few um, BAME um, academics or students in, in, in your institution, actively mentor and support them. If there are few fewer women, actively mentor and support them as well. Last but not least, I just want to look at how we've been improving the sense of belonging at SBS at, at the University of Kent. Some of the things that we've done recently is to start the BAME uh, network for, for students. We've elected our, our first um, president for, for that network and, and she'll be helping to promote uh, inclusion amongst students that form this category at the, the school. We are also in the process of setting up an international student network as well um, for the same reasons. We have a society for um, our students, chemistry and forensic science as well, and I believe there's one also for physics um, at the school. We've served a scholarship group in the last year or so, and all academics on teaching and scholarship contracts are invited to sit on, on this group. And I have found that it's been immensely helpful being able to network with other colleagues in the school has really helped me personally. And the school is, is also focused on building a sense of belonging amongst all students and, and, and staff. And, and I believe that all of these things are, are helping to really tackle and deal with the problem of isolation and some of its um, effects upon our students and also staff. Um, that is all I, I want to cover. But in conclusion, I want to say that this is an, an important issue because it can cause some very serious problems, you know, with mental health, um, loss of confidence and, and loss of, of motivation and morale. These are all very serious consequences that, that result from, from isolation. And I think the work that the RSC is doing is fantastic in tackling you know, isolation. Most of these things that I've, I've, I've um, discussed 
have been intensified by, by the pandemic, the sense of isolation has probably been intensified by the pandemic as well. But, but I believe that we can work through some of these examples that are given in helping to deal and tackle this problem of isolation. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's, it's great to see that you're taking such a, a sort of pluralistic, a multi-armed approach at the University of Kent. That it's not just about let's have a society for the chemists, but you are trying to make sure that you branch out and have international student groups and, and that sort of thing as well. It's not, uh, there is always a risk, of course, of just entrenching people. If you have a society for chemists and that's your only option as a chemist, but actually if you may also have an interest in, in chess, in board games, in playing squash. It's, it's lovely to be able to have those crossover groups of friends uh, and groups of people that you interact with. So thank you for sharing your experience so far at the University of Kent. Aaron will be with us, so stick around for more questions, uh, which will come after our next, our third and final guest, Desiree Dickinson. She is a clinical psychologist who specializes in the mental health and well-being of our research community. She's a former postdoc in neuroscience, and she works globally with universities, lab groups, and academics in the pursuit of a healthier approach to scientific research. Desiree, thank you ever so much for joining us. I shall step back and let you take it away. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and thank you, Rachel. I promise to try and speak at a pace that is useful <laughs> and workable. Uh, thank you to the Royal Society of Chemistry, to Chemistry World, and to Mita and to Aaron for capturing some of the challenges that many of the academics face and in evidencing for us the exciting ways in which you guys have been addressing isolation and belonging within your own work and through your passion for a more inclusive academic community. I have to say that I think that this is an ideal time to be talking about isolation because COVID has exposed many of us to this experience. It's given us some insight into what isolation might feel like. But for many of the academic community, however, isolation isn't just a two month hiatus from the usual social program. For many of our community, this, is a, this level of isolation and loneliness is the normal experience. And it's required a pandemic for many of us to appreciate the extent to which such isolation is truly harmful. Isolation is a chronic stressor. It is toxic to our mental health and to our well-being. And as a member of the academic community, we must strive for a sense of belonging and to foster it in those around us. Because without it, we cannot thrive. Our students and our staff cannot thrive. And having lived the nomadic existence of an academic, I've started from scratch at least five times in my adult life. New cities, new countries, completely removed from family, starting again with that 20 kilo suitcase in a country that isn't my own, without the language that you need, uh, and to either to live or to feel included. I have certainly known loneliness and isolation in my life, and I have had to, and I still have to, work very hard to build a true sense of belonging uh, even now. And I'm not alone in this either. Studies show that 40% of our academic site isolation as the biggest factor impacting on their mental health. And that 64% of PhD candidates feel socially isolated. That's huge. Isolation, isolation can, trigger, can be triggered by many factors, right? Mita and Aaron have captured many of those key causes. And there are just a few that I wanna to touch on. Factors that stem from the academic culture itself driven by behaviours that are seemingly embedded within what it means to be an academic. The unwritten rule book, if you will, cultural norms that drive or justify isolation. Norms that are toxic and that need to be changed. For example, as academics, we tend to live our lives as a sprint rather than the ultra marathon that you are in fact running. Now, as, a sprint from, as you sprint from one deadline to the next, you rarely stop to reflect on your progress, or on your achievement. And because it's a sprint, you tend to justify sacrificing other aspects of your lives because I just need to get this done. And when this is done, then I'll call my mum or I'll catch up with those friends or I'll take a break. But academia is a sprint without end. There will always be another deadline approaching, always a justification for sacrificing your social life and your social connection for the sake of your PhD progress or your career advancement. 
our, uh, we naturally prioritize our work above our social interactions because ticking that box feels more urgent, feels more important, feels more valuable to your future life and your career than the perceived benefits of spending time with others. Many, many of us have a tendency to self-isolate when there's a big deadline coming up, right? The PhD being a very, very common example of this. You simply want to concentrate and get it finish, finished. But, but what many then experience is that, you, uh, that as you isolate yourself, is what we see is a decline in your mood. We see an increase in your worry and anxiety. We see a waning concentration and motivation as that confinement progresses. And then many of us then misread those feelings, those sensations as evidence of our own incompetence or our lack of ability. And that in turn only compounds the levels of stress that we feel. We feel overwhelmed by our perceived lack of progress. What we typically fail to realize is just, just how unhealthy it is to have removed ourselves from our necessary social connections. And that that, that is having a huge impact on your mood on your stress levels and on your well-being, and obviously on your ability to get that PhD finished. Another example are those short-term contracts coupled with that demand for mobility that drives the sense that, well, I'm there to work, and you're there to get that job done. Those thoughts tend to go hand in hand with thoughts like, well, what's the point? You're only there for a two or three year contract. You've already made and said goodbye to too many friends and the effort of doing it again when it, you have so much work to do doesn't really seem worth it. Socializing and social connection can feel hard or it can often conflict with your work driven priorities at times. But social connection is worth the effort. Why? Well, for a few key, very important reasons. Connection and belonging are a universal, basic human need. As infants, if those needs are not met, we die. Even as adults, where arguably you might have the resources to survive alone, we have an inbuilt need for connection, to belong, to be part of the group, to give and to receive the attention of others. And when that need is not met, our system is in a state of stress. Isolation becomes a chronic stressor because as far as our brains are concerned, social isolation renders us unsafe. Social isolation is a death sentence as far as our evolutionary wiring is concerned. Back in the day, you'd either be eaten or you would starve. So our brains are intimately tuned into the, all of the cues in our interactions and into the, within the social environment. We're wired for a sense of belonging. And when those needs aren't met, we see increased levels of psychological distress, anxiety and depression, and a raft of other health issues. Critically, socializing doesn't just move you back to zero. No, socializing is really, really, really good for you. In fact, socializing and social connection are just important for your health and your longevity as, say, a heavy smoker quitting smoking or someone who doesn't exercise, taking up exercise. Sadly, when you go to the doctors though, our social calendar really features in that checkup. We know that social, people who socialize well, they live longer than those who don't. Their brains are sharper, their memories work better, they have fewer strokes, and they even get less colds and flus, which is counterintuitive given that they are actually hanging out with more people. Well, at least this held while well before COVID arrived, obviously. But Socializing and a sense of belonging is good for you. Our sense of connection and belonging doesn't just help with our physical and our mental health. It actually, as, as Aaron mentioned, it impacts significantly on your productivity at work and on our achievement levels. Now, Greg Walton is a social psychologist at Sanford and he studies belonging and its impact on achievement. And he says that when any of us enters a room, any environment, we ask ourselves this question. Or rather, he would say that the environment, the context, evokes the question, is this a place where I can belong? Often not consciously, but the question is posed. And through our subsequent interactions, our perceptions, our experiences within that space, we begin to form an answer. Do I belong here? If you feel underrepresented in that space, then that question may be made more salient to you. 
if you have prior experiences in that space, those experiences will often help you to shape how you answer that question without necessarily seeking out any real data from that environment. And if you're an imposter, if you already feel like you don't belong at the table, then you might be inclined to filter information in a way that is consistent with your belief that you don't belong. Do I belong here? How we answer that question impacts on our ability to achieve academically because it's self-fulfilling. We tend to begin to behave in ways that are consistent with our belief that we don't belong. And we can enter into what Greg Walton calls a toxic tornado. Maybe I don't belong here. Maybe then I can't do it. And if I can't do it, then what's the point in trying? Which feeds back into the, well, maybe I just don't belong here. Maybe I can't do it. Maybe there's no point in trying. And there you have that toxic tornado in action. When you fear that you don't belong in an environment, it begins to change the way you engage with that environment. Now, as someone who's suffered significantly from imposter syndrome during my academic career, I experienced this toxic, toxic tornado in its full force. Right? Despite any achievements that I may have had, I was absolutely convinced that I was not good enough, not smart enough, that I did not belong in academia. And with that narrative constantly running in the background, I wouldn't raise my hand if I had an idea because I was convinced that it must be stupid. You know, if I would delay or completely avoid meetings with my supervisor. I was convinced that I had to do everything. I had to learn everything by myself constantly trying to prove to everyone that I belonged. My fears of others fight, realizing that I didn't belong stopped me from engaging with that environment effectively, which directly impacted on my ability to do my job well. Now, I've tried to illustrate just a few, just a few of the factors that contribute to one sense of isolation in academia. And hopefully I've begun to make a case for why social connection and belonging is in fact really important because to belong is to feel safe, is to feel connected, is to identify as someone of merit who is worthy of belonging within the group. Now, if we consider that each of us is subconsciously or consciously asking that question, is this a space where I can belong? Every time we walk into a room, every time we enter into an interaction or a virtual space, then how will you answer that question? And as an academic community, as an HOD, as a supervisor, a fellow student, we each need to ask ourselves, what am I doing to help others answer that question in a way that will help them to thrive? Because in order for each of us to do our jobs to the best of our abilities, and heaven forbid to actually enjoy doing it, we need connection. We need a sense of belonging to identify as a valued member of our academic community. So as individuals who are feeling isolated right now, what could you do? Well, first of all, remember that nearly all forms of social interaction and social connection are good for you. So make sure you are in a position to engage and to interact with other human beings, fellow academics or otherwise. In terms of laying a solid foundation for your physical and your mental health, you can find those connections wherever you like, right? Maybe you're alone in a new city, but you love jazz or to climb or to dance. If you have a tendency to work at home for days and barely leave the house or barely leave the office, you can't interact. It can be the green grocer or the cute coffee guy. It doesn't matter. Social interactions, even in their most simplest form, are good for you. So go out and start interacting. But what about connection? Well, those yearly departmental you know, parties or those happy hours are not going to suddenly pave the way for those who already feel like an outsider to suddenly belong, right? Those are often spaces for those who already belong. They are great, they are necessary, but they're not enough, right? These spaces are filled with small talk and it's very difficult to create a connection through small talk. A true sense of connection and belonging requires finding some common threads, right? To find those common threads, we have to go about offering up a thread, a tidbit, an insight into who we are, a thread that the other person then can then grab hold of and offer up their own. And then slowly we begin to weave together those common threads in a way that connects you and allows you to feel connected, to feel seen, to feel heard 
to feel acknowledged, to feel welcome. And to do this requires us to be vulnerable. To ask someone if they would be keen to go for a walk over to that lecture with you or to head to the tea room with you, that requires an element of vulnerability. They can always say no. In academia, we tend to have a te we have a tendency to, to maintain a very shiny veneer, right? To not want to show our weaknesses, to always put our best foot forward, to appear capable and competent at all times. Vulnerable is not a side of ourselves that we typically like to show. Okay, but that facade creates distance. And to maintain that facade, you need to maintain distance for fear that someone will see the fraying edges. The difficulty is, is that when we are constantly comparing our own inner turmoil, our doubts and our fears to their shiny facade, of course there's a distance. If no one ever talks about their challenges, their doubts, their failings, then we tend to think it's only us. And of course we don't feel like we belong. The reality is, is that our inner doubts, the challenges, the failings, those are what unite us. Those are the common threads. And by offering up those threads, you're signaling to the other person that you trust them enough to share that information with them and that this is a space where they can do likewise. Now, I'm not suggesting you sit down and share your life story over a coffee, but just think about how you perceive those around you, your peers, your supervisors, those academic superstars we idolize, your colleagues, whoever. We live out our lives thinking that everyone around us is coping, is more productive, is more capable, that they, they have their lives together and that we are the mess. When the truth is, is that we have more in common than we tend to think and that you belong infinitely more than you think. If you're a professor, then try lowering that facade every now and then. A throwaway, do you know it took, you know, do you know how many years it took for me to learn that? Or, man, I still feel like I suck at this. And suddenly a student thinks, well, if they find things hard too, then maybe I can do this. Maybe I do belong here. Maybe I'm not so alone as, alone as I always feel. As a community, we need to create spaces, conversations where individuals can share their experiences and offer up those threads for others to engage with, to begin to see the many common threads that we have among us. So reach out, embrace vulnerability, offer up that thread. They might take it, they might not, but it opens a door for the possibility and it might be the lifeline for them and for you. And remember that it is a process. A true sense of belonging takes time to build and it takes effort, but it can be game changing for your mental health, for your physical health, as well as for your career. So stick with it, keep showing up and keep offering up those threads. And that's it from me, Ben. Ben, where are you? I'm still here. I'm still here. Thank you ever so much, Desiree. Thank you. It's really interesting to have uh, your perspective. It ties together everything that we've already heard today. We are running over, but I'm still going to squeeze in some questions because our audience have been kind enough to ask lots of really excellent questions. Thank you ever so much to everyone. Uh, Desiree, let's, let's start with you, since we've already got you, but we will also get our other speakers back. We may as well get their cameras up soon. Um, you talk about uh, being able to open up, share your vulnerabilities in order to make real, genuine connections. Uh, but how do you find a balance between uh, being, being open and vulnerable uh, in order to form those connections, but also wanting to protect yourself from judgment, risking being, being too open, maybe too open too quickly, and really just protecting yourself from being hurt? How do you strike that balance? I think it, as always, it's, 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 taking the spotlight off yourself. I think we so readily put that, shine that light on ourselves and, and see what will, what's gonna happen to me if I do that, rather than saying, what might happen to them if I offer this? Rather than the thread just being about my isolation, it's about theirs, or it's about creating a connection, which is for both of you, you know, which is for the space. So if we take that spotlight, zoom it out a bit even, and just say, well, what might happen here? Then maybe it, it, you seem less, the vulnerability feels less scary, would I could say perhaps, right? That the sense that that what could, you know, think about maybe the possibility as opposed to the fears, because fear is what's driving that, right? What what might happen? And and I suppose giving people the benefit of the doubt that that if you wouldn't go and expose someone else for sharing something like that, let's assume that they wouldn't either and give it a try. Uh, it's also a really good point that you bring up about uh, how open and comfortable people feel 
being themselves, being spoken, being heard, walking into a room and feeling like they belong. I think there's a lot of people, and I certainly count myself in this, who have taken that feeling for granted for a very long time. And this is probably my back, background, the, the uh, advantages that I've had given to me throughout life. I rarely struggle in a meeting to feel I can't possibly say this. No, no one will take me seriously. It's a stupid idea. I'm very comfortable being the sort of person who will put my hand up and make possibly a stupid suggestion. Um, but it is a real lesson for people like me, people who have these advantages, that we do need to think that that's not how everybody sees the world. Mm -hmm. And there will be other people in the room that we need to make space for, that we need to make time for. And maybe having a meeting where people like me can just speak our minds is not always the best way to get the best out of everybody. And I think it's only quite recently that people have been encouraged to really check their privilege and challenge their own perspectives on that. I think we still have a very long way to go, but I'm really pleased to see events like this that are encouraging people to do that. Um, Mita, let's come back to you for a second. This is clearly something you try very hard to do in your own work. Uh, but Alicia said, um, how or could you give any suggestions for how you would approach a topic along the lines of anxiety mental health problems and so on with a pi or a supervisor or a manager who seems to be unwilling they've said i don't have any experience with this i don't really know what i'm supposed to do how would you get those conversations rolling and what advice would you have for somebody in that position Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, that could be a very tricky situation if, you know, the person in power kind of shuts you off uh, to these conversations. It makes it difficult for the student to really push for that. Um, what I would say is if you don't have a supportive PI or a manager or a mentor, uh, see if there is somebody else uh, who is in sort of a similar position uh, who is willing to listen. Uh, look out for resources at your institution or workplace to see if, um, you know, for example, a lot of universities do have a place where students can go and talk. Uh, they offer counseling, see if you can seek out those resources and maybe work with a counselor, like with a professional, uh, as to how they might uh, bring this topic up in a constructive way uh, with their PI or manager. Um, so that would be my advice. Uh, and I'm really sorry to hear that they're not uh, open to have these conversations. Thank you, Alicia, for sharing. Uh, if if counselling, if you don't feel that's quite right for you, then coaching is also a, a really good, uh, if that's something that your institution offers, a really good tool to seek. Very useful for these sorts of things, but also very good for understanding your own thought processes and even your career progression, coaching can be a really useful tool for that. Uh, Aaron, we've had a question from Tori who uh, says they run social uh, activities for their student group, but it always tends to be the same group. It's always that clique who attend these uh, social events. Uh, what are there, or what advice would you have for ways to change that culture to make it more welcoming to the people who don't normally attend uh, and that sort of thing. I guess also we, we should say maybe some people don't attend because they are perfectly happy as they are. They want to go home and knit or uh, you know, read a book or write the book that they're writing. There shouldn't be pressure on everybody to attend, but how should we try and make sure that these events are welcoming to absolutely everyone? Yeah, thank you, Ben. And I, I think it's, it's worth noting that some people are just perfectly, you know, being, being by themselves and, and doing their own thing. Um, but, but there are scores of people that perhaps want to belong, but they just find some of these events not to their liking. And I think probably employing some of what Peter does, uh, allowing her research group to actually pick activities would be helpful. Um, what I have found very effective in my line of work, not as an academic, but as, as part of the chaplaincy team, is to work alongside existing networks, you know, outside institutions. So some of the clubs and societies, we try and tap into that and see what activities seem to be popular. And, and we try and replicate that, you know, ourselves. And that, that tends to work. But I think it's actually involving um, the, the, the stakeholders 
asking people what kinds of activities that they would like to see take place. Because what may be very popular in England may not be very popular you know, in other places and we're getting students and academics from all over the world. And we have to bear that in mind. And that, that's what I'd say. In fact, Lanell uh, has said they are a, research, a researcher at a university in South Africa and their social schedule, as it were, with their work colleagues is clearly very different. They maybe have one or two uh, whole research group social activities per year. Uh, so Lanell wanted to know what, how often you think is healthy. Uh, any idea what, just as a ballpark guide for how often you should be trying to, to put these social activities into your work? What, what I've actually found is if things are too often, it, it can congest the, the, the already you know, tight kinds of people. So, so pick something that is quite sensible. I think if it's just not often enough, then again, it, it doesn't quite help in, in terms of building a sense of belonging. But what we have found quite um, it tends to work is that put a variety of things on and not expect everyone to turn up for every one of them. So you put a variety of things on and those that perhaps is suitable to them will turn up and those that don't may turn up for the next one. So just have a variety of things, you know, at regular intervals and be careful that you don't congest people's people's calendar too much. But I think it's been regular enough to, to help build that kind of sense of belonging amongst you know students or, or staff. Uh, it's probably uh, timely as well to add that uh, we're talking about changing the way that academia in particular socializes and the sorts of events that academia holds and uh, just in the last few weeks there has been an announcement of a geological society in the uk i can't remember which one uh, changing the way that they do their sort of social meetings and basically no longer offering alcohol at these meetings and there has been quite a kickback from the people who perhaps have more traditionally enjoyed going along to these events, drinking uh, as much as they feel comfortable drinking. And that has been a key part of the social life of their geological society. So we do need to expect that some people are going to be a bit resistant to change and we certainly shouldn't stop doing all of the activities that we know people already enjoy and do benefit from. It's about diversifying the activities and making sure that it is welcoming, uh, it creates opportunities for people who otherwise would, would not have been able to get involved because they're in a bar, for example. But it, it's the sort of advice that, that all of you have given Fantastic advice, but but do be prepared that some people will be very stuck in the mud. We do need people like yourselves who are willing and able to make those changes in order to make a, a better research culture uh, for all of us. So uh, you know, it, even if you do find some of the, the old guards still really want to hold that meeting in the pub instead of the coffee shop, or they uh, want, to, want to go to a uh, nightclub instead of going for a nice long walk, then uh, be prepared for that. But you're the right people making the right sorts of changes. Now, thank you ever so much, Desiree, Aaron, Mita. I, I think we have probably run out of time. In fact, we've run really badly over time, but thank you, all, all three of you for joining us anyway. It's been fantastic to have you with us. Uh, just before we go, I'm going to flag up a few further resources that are related to the Building a Better Chemistry Culture series. Uh, on screen at the moment, we have the Chemists Community Funds. There's a couple of different links there. If you are a member of the RSC, then that rsc.ly slash ccf events uh, has links to workshop type events that may uh, follow on from the sorts of things we talked about today. Day, uh, and they do put on a really good, much more um, sort of interactive presentations. Usually only 50 or so people are allowed in. So have a look at that, see if they've got the sorts of things that you want. Also, CCF Health uh, is there as a set of resources from the Chemist Community Fund to help the chemistry community. Also on the phone number is the phone, it's also on the screen, sorry, it's the phone number for the Samaritans. They are always there. If you feel that you need somebody to talk to and you don't have anyone else to turn to, then the Samaritans is the right place. Uh, Shout to provide a very similar service by text as well. So do have a look at that. Now, next month, we are talking about bullying and harassment, in particular, how we tackle bullying and harassment in the chemical sciences. You can register for that webinar 
on screen now is the link that you will need, so I'll let you take a note of that. Uh, we'll look at how bullying and harassing behaviours, or what they look like in the chemical sciences. We'll look at the impact that bullying and harassment can have on individuals and on their careers. We'll look at the difficulties that people face struggling to talk to friends and colleagues about their experiences, and again, opening up, being willing to be vulnerable in order to start those those conversations is, uh, is really key to this. And we'll look at how institutions can enact mechanisms to bring about positive culture and behavioral change. Now, I just need to remind myself, looking very quickly on my other screen as to what the date is for that, <laughs> which I really should have got on this slide in front of you, but uh, you'll certainly find it if you go to that link, so rsc.ly slash tackling bullying webinar. But that is taking place on the 13th of August at 3.30 in the afternoon. Do put that in your calendars, register now, come and join us. It's the next one in our whole series of Building a Better Chemistry Culture. So that's it for me. Thank you again to our guests. Thank you to the inclusion and diversity team at the Royal Society of Chemistry who have helped to put all of this together. And thank you to you for engaging, for asking great questions and for coming along. Thank you to Rachel for doing the uh, BSL translation once again. She'll be with us next month as well. We really hope that you're benefiting from her. Do drop us a line if there's anything else like that that we can do to help make these webinars more engaging for you and more accessible. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and we'll see you for the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks again.